Hello info person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about lasers. Well, actually, space lasers. Space lasers right here on planet Earth. And to give you a bit more context, let's take a look at this video right here. Did you see that? Yeah, it was kind of difficult to see. Let's take a look at this with contrast enhanced. Something is firing lasers from space towards planet Earth. Mysterious? Unusual? Unexpected? None of the above. This is actually a really, really common concept when it comes to various satellites. But this is probably one of the first times it was captured with so much detail right here from planet Earth. And specifically captured by the Subaru telescope ran by the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, but located in Hawaii. Although in this case, captured by a ridiculously powerful camera that it currently has, known as the Subaru Asahi Star Camera. But by itself, not knowing where this is coming from, I can see how this is actually going to create quite a lot of conspiracy theories. And so let's talk about what we know about this and what the scientists believe this was created by. And also why this was made to begin with. And so in a nutshell, this is known as surface mapping. And essentially this is a satellite flying above planet Earth, firing continuous lasers at the surface, reflecting them from the surface, receiving the photons that are reflected, and then measuring the very, very accurate distance with the error being approximately 3 centimeters, or about 1 inch. And this is something that's been used ever since the 1974 Apollo mission that used some of the first technology when it comes to range-finding lasers, something that has really matured in the last few decades. And originally the scientists thought that it's actually coming from this American satellite, this satellite ran by NASA known as ICESat-2, Ice Cloud and Land Elevation Satellite 2nd Edition, that's basically expected to do just this fire green lasers from the top in order to measure precise distance to whatever is underneath. The first edition, ISAT-1, has started doing this approximately two decades ago, with ISAT-2 joining in in 2018. But there's a bit of a problem here. When the Subaru camera was able to take these photos, according to the orbital calculation parameters that you can actually find yourself in the website in the description, this satellite was not in that position, it was not above Hawaii, which means that it must have been something else. And because all of the satellites are tracked around the planet extremely accurately, it did not take long to figure out what satellite this most likely came from, but more importantly, answered the mystery of why nobody was claiming these lasers came from their satellite. But before we talk about who did this, let's talk about the more exciting part, the science of these lasers and how all of this works. Because to me personally, this is actually the more exciting part. The exciting science of space lasers. Which, by the way, is something you can read about in the incredible link created by NASA in the description below. And the way that all of this works involves three different components. A transmitter, a receiver, and a timer. And this is essentially how it works for pretty much all modern satellites. The transmitter, in this case, sends out a single beam that's then diffracted at a slight angle. This is mostly done so there's a bit more dispersal and so that there's also a slightly higher chance for some of the photons to come back reflecting from the surface. And one question I always had was, why green lasers? Why not use different colors? Well, partially it's because of the cost, but partially it's also because of the property of green light. Turns out, green light, because of its higher frequency compared to blue lasers, tends to scatter much more, even in clean air, which means that it can cover much wider surface. And so because of its higher scattering, even compared to red light, today it's actually widely used in astronomy for different reasons. And if you ever visit any astronomical facility that provides night observations, you'll see that they often use green laser pointers. And that's because as the air scatters the photons, using the same power they actually seem to be much brighter than other colors, with human eye even being more sensitive to green at low light levels, and thus create a much larger point visible from a faraway distance. Although in case of satellite observations, they essentially are more likely to be reflected and more likely to come back compared to some of the other colors. And so, as all of these green lasers are being fired from the satellite, and here we're talking about trillions of photons firing from the laser itself, only a small, small fraction of them is going to come back, even though so many get reflected from the surface itself. And in order to receive these photons, the satellite has its own tiny telescope, approximately 0.8 meters or 2.6 feet in diameter. And this telescope is specifically meant to receive these photons as they come back but only a tiny fraction or only a few dozen of these photons are going to be reflected and received by the telescope, with the final part, the timer, then determining the time of travel. And this allows the scientists, by knowing the speed of light, to extremely precisely calculate the distance from the satellite to the surface of the planet, down to about 1 inch or approximately 3 centimeters. Although as you can see from the video here, it is a pretty complex process, 
So for example the telescope despite receiving all sorts of light, inside has a bunch of filters that only allow extremely precise frequency of 532 nanometers, very precise green light. And that's of course to avoid any contamination from other light coming from the planet. It then ends up adding up all of the reflections and produces a kind of an average determining the exact elevation of whatever it is it's looking at. It could be ice, land or water. But because this technology has matured so much in the last few decades, today the use of these green lasers for ranging activities is extremely common in a lot of different industries, or for a lot of different types of mapping. Over time, allowing scientists to create very accurate maps of various surfaces, including Earth, the Moon and even planet Mars. But the thing about this particular detection is that it doesn't actually seem to have a very advanced laser compared to what's expected from the ISAT-2 mission and even the pattern itself doesn't really seem to be the same. This here uses an extremely powerful laser able to produce approximately 10,000 pulses per second and as you can see from this video, it creates a pattern that's a little bit more spread out compared to what we observe. Whereas the observations from Hawaii suggested a much older laser but also with a very different pattern. It seems to only follow a single line. And like I mentioned before, ISAT-2 was not even in the same location. But there was another very new satellite in this location at this time. A satellite that was only launched a few months ago, but is always launched without really telling everyone about it. A Chinese satellite. A satellite known as Dakui-1. And because China doesn't usually announce its launches very actively, it took a while for everyone to figure out exactly where these lasers came from. But this is not a spy satellite or even a military satellite. It's actually just like ISAT-1. It's a first generation atmospheric satellite meant to do just this, mapping the surface using a very similar technology. And according to orbital calculations, this satellite was in the right position, right above Hawaii at that time. And it's also obviously a satellite that has an extremely similar mapping technology or ranging technology. It uses LIDAR to measure distances to the surface of the planet, which is exactly what we're observing here. This is how it would look if you were to somehow see this with your own eyes. But this is super super quick, it only takes like one second. So definitely nothing unusual here, nothing conspiratory in any way and absolutely nothing unexplained. As a matter of fact, China is planning to launch another satellite, Dakui-2, in order to provide even more data on various atmospheric changes because for the most part, the goal of their scientific programs in the last few years has actually been that. They are observing a lot of climatic changes and they're trying to measure as many aerosols as possible. Although one problem is of course communication with the rest of the community. It's actually still possible to get the data from these satellites, but it's not as easy as for example accessing data from NASA. First of all you would have to speak Mandarin, second of all you have to get access through various means, usually through some kind of a research facility, and third of all there are always some other blunders related to the Chinese bureaucracy. But nevertheless, in theory, the data is accessible and hopefully will be made more accessible in the future. And chances are that in the next few years, we will also probably get to see the results of all of these studies, very likely provided in English. But when it comes to laser technology, especially these types of astronomical lasers, there have been some other really intriguing propositions, especially coming from the facilities like this. As a matter of fact, some of the ESA's observatories have become extremely good at tracking different objects by using this laser-based ranging technology. In other words, some of these observatories use their lasers to directly measure distances to various objects flying above, usually satellites, but also various tiny particles, various space debris. And this is actually what the scientists want to take this next. Because of the ability to track debris so accurately now, they think they can actually use these lasers to start nudging these objects as they fly above the planet. And by using a powerful enough laser, it becomes possible to nudge some of these objects by just a tiny minute amount, enough to potentially change their orbit before it collides with something else, or more importantly, to potentially completely deorbit certain types of particles that we refer to as space debris, or space junk, which you might already know represents a huge problem for our planet. A problem that's becoming worse and worse every single year. And so since the tracking of these objects has become so accurate, and also because the laser tracking has become so accurate as well, it becomes possible to combine the two and to use really powerful lasers fired from facilities like this one in order to eventually deorbit as many small particles as possible. It obviously would not work on larger particles, mostly because of their mass, but for anything small enough that's already detected and poses a bit of a problem, this is definitely a viable technique. Something that ESA is currently developing actively and something you can read more about in the article in the description below. It's referred to as IZN-1 laser and is currently located on Tenerife. They also provide us with this really intriguing image showing us the overall map of various objects in the orbit 
with the current estimate for tiny particles approximately 1 cm or even smaller in size being about 100 million or more. With even smaller particles, just a few millimeters across, currently numbering in billions. Which means that in order to prevent something like this from happening, we would probably need a lot of these lasers firing all at once all across the planet. But in theory it's also possible to use this for potential communication as well. Another plan for this facility is to try to use its laser to possibly reflect it from something else in space and to then deliver information to a point somewhere far away from the original source, a kind of a fiber optic cable. But this is still something that's being developed and something that has not been tested yet. But something we'll be discussing more in future videos as ESA gets a little bit closer to the development of all of these really exciting projects. But I guess when it comes to this unusual observation, well, nothing unusual here. It's just something we don't see very often and it's something that's really cool, but something that's very, very common. On that note, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Subscribe. Share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. And maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.